Welcome to the Benzo Free Podcast, your home for an honest, straightforward, and personal discussion about anti-anxiety drugs, their effects, and how to deal with dependence and withdrawal. Whether you have taken benzodiazepines, Z drugs, or any other tranquilizers, know someone who has, or you just want help dealing with chronic anxiety and insomnia, this is your podcast. I'm your host, D.E. Foster, author of the book, Benzo Free, The World of Anti-Anxiety Drugs and the Reality of Withdrawal. I'm so glad you joined us today. Please stick around and let me bend your ear for a few minutes. It just might feel a little better on the other side. Well, hello there. This is Dee, and welcome to episode 122 of the Benzo Free Podcast. It's been a while since I did a normal episode of the podcast. Um, actually, since I've done any episode of the podcast. <laughs> but here it is. So let's catch up. Uh, I'm not going to say I will keep this brief, um, like I mentioned in my last blog post, because I know I'm not going to do it today. So this is going to be a full episode. But I just got a lot to say, and here it goes. First off, my wife and I are back from a two-week vacation. We had a great time with family, saw some great sights, saw some beautiful, even stunning countryside, and drove. <laughs> drove a lot <laughs> and kept driving. We did 14 states and 4,400 miles. <laughs> I know some of you are just, you know, rolling your eyes at that. Um, and I have to admit, even though I love road trips, even for me, it was a little much driving and we'll readjust as we do future trips. But things changed and we had to adjust as things happened. Still, we had a great time and getting away was definitely something we needed. As I mentioned in my blog post, um, taking vacation is important. We all know that. And there's that even when you're dealing with bind when you're dealing with benzo withdrawal getting away from the routine is important we all need that break we need to change things and adjust things in our lives so it's not always the same thing over and over again <sighs> i know this may not sound like a vacation many of you enjoy and quite honestly we'll probably do a destination vacation next time i love those too but sometimes i like the driving one this was just a little more driving than we had planned on doing Still, it got us away from work for the most part. We had some time to spend together and spend with family and see parts of the country we'd always wanted to visit. And the best part is we didn't catch COVID, <laughs> as far as I know. So far, no signs of even a cold or flu or COVID. And if you've been with me on my previous trips, I always came home with something. And COVID, I came home from, we had COVID on two yeah, two of our trips, I've had COVID on, <laughs> either got it as we were leaving or got it as we came back. Um, so I'm grateful we didn't catch that. So we're back home and back to work. Let me catch you up on a couple of the quick things, and then we'll dive right into the rest of the podcast. Since I've been back, we've been, I've been catching up with the Benzodiazepine Action Work Group. Um, our peer support training program is moving right along. A um, lot of progress there. We actually are just about to schedule our very first Colorado class, our official class. Um, we had the pilot class back in December that Dr. Christy Huff and myself presented. Um, and this will be the first um, paid or, or out there class. We're starting with a couple in Colorado and then we'll go nationally. I'm also meeting with my research teams, lots of progress there, some great news coming up. I'll share that once that gets published and out there, but some really great news on the research front and a lot of other research team progress that we're doing along the way. And of course, Easing Anxiety, our website. Um, my main goal now over the next month or two is to focus on that and enhance that. So if you have been to our website and you have signed up, which many of you have, and it's amazing, I love seeing that. Um, you're going to start seeing things. I'm going to start setting up some maybe chats. I might even set up a support thing. These are all things that I'll be setting up that will be part of our membership portal eventually, but right now they're completely free. Um, and sign up and set up a profile, whatever you want to, and you're online and you will see things. So some of the content moving forward that I'm going to be creating will only be on the website. Um, I'm feeling really good, um, positive. I still 
have symptom issues I'm dealing with, still medically trying to figure some things out just to catch you all up. Despite all the great things going on, I must admit I'm, I'm still struggling with some of the COVID slash benzo thing, as I talked in a previous episode, that I've had the long COVID last December. It kicked off a wave of, of symptoms, and I seem to still be in and out of this wave that includes um, some pretty strong tinnitus, um, pulsatile tinnitus in my ear, dysphagia, which is difficulty swallowing. I haven't gotten the throat tightening back this time, but the dysphagia has come back since vacation a little bit, so I'm still having to focus on swallowing. Um, my facial paresthesia has kicked up. I got the spiders on the left side of my face and some achesthesia and, you know, some other stuff. But, but things I've dealt with, things I know how to deal with for the most part, but I'm still getting them checked out. I'm finding a new doctor, um, trying to get my medical thing in place. And something I recommend to all of us is make sure you get your medical checkups done. Make sure, you know, just because you got benzos, it's easy for us to or at least it's easy for me, and but I think it is for some of you too to say, oh, that's just a benzo, or that's just a benzo thing, or that's just a symptom related to bind, instead of saying, I should get that checked out first. And sometimes it's just good to get these things checked out. And one of my main focuses now that the, the parental thing is done and behind me, I can now focus on my own health. So, so I'm getting some tests done I've needed to, getting a physical, I've been going to the dentist, I've been going to all these different medical things to make sure I monitor. So please don't let what I did happen to you. Don't ignore your own physical health for too long because things will pile up. And part of what I'm dealing with now, I'm sure, is related to just not paying attention to some things. So anyway. Oh... I think we're ready to move on. I think so. Our admin stuff real quickly. Today, our episode will include our intro, which you just heard, our mailbag, our benzo story, our feature, which is going to be focused on the loss of self, loss of confidence during benzo withdrawal. And we will close out with our moment of peace. Yes, we have a full lineup. I'm glad to be back to our standard format. Um, it's something I'm familiar with and I'm excited about it. Before we move on, don't forget to check out our different channels. You can find us on YouTube and Twitter at Easing ANX or on Facebook at Easing ANX FB. Or even better, visit the new website at easinganxiety.com where you can find all our content, search for any subject, log in and set up your own personal profile, subscribe to our mailing list, and comment on our nearly 300 posts. And remember, I'm going to get this out here. The Benson Free Podcast is for informational purposes only and should never be considered medical advice. Maybe I should do those disclaimers on, you know, those those drug things, <laughs> if I can talk one more time. And remember, the Benzo Free Project, I, I can't do it. I can't do it twice, <laughs> but sometimes I'll just spit it out. The Benzo Free Podcast is for informational purposes only. I should never consider medical advice. There you go. Now, let's take a look at our mail bag, and I will slow down a little bit. Oh, okay. Today, we have one question and one comment to share in our mail bag. And our first question is from Charles in Illinois. And his question is regarding tinnitus. Now, before I dive in, yes, I do know there are two pronunciations here, tinnitus and tinnitus. One does not appear to be more accurate than the other in the research I've done. I usually just say tinnitus just out of habit, but just so you know, as I read this and talk about it, I'm not picking one over the other. Both, I think, are correct. Charles writes, Hi, I have been taking lorazepam at a van for many years as prescribed by my doctor. It's been prescribed mainly for insomnia, which started 12 years ago. Initially, I took it occasionally, increasing to 2 to 3 milligrams nightly since then. My doctor feels a low dosage is not harming and helps sleep, though I've now found it less helpful for long sleep. I've attempted to start to reduce slowly as I know it's an issue to stop quickly, and have been one and a half milligrams for a while, with steps to reduce further being difficult. I'm now bothered by increased annoying tinnitus, and worry my continued plan to reduce will make it worse. Is there any advice from anyone on how I may deal with this issue? Thanks. Well, thank you, Charles. Um, thanks for the question. As you probably know, tinnitus is one of the more common symptoms of benzo withdrawal or bind. I had three types of tinnitus early in my withdrawal, a constant high-pitched background hiss or noise that I mostly ignore, which is still there. 
occasional sharp high-pitched sound in one ear that usually fades within a minute or so, and what is called pulsatile tinnitus, which follows the rhythm of my pulse. Since my recent struggles with long COVID, the latter one, the pulsatile tinnitus, has returned and stronger, stronger than it was before. In fact, I can hear it pretty strong in my right ear right now as I'm speaking to you. I've seen my doctor, an audiologist, and an ENT doctor, but really no answers, which means it's probably benzodiazepines. In fact, for me, it's probably long COVID and benzodiazepines. For those of us who have been dealing with buying for so long, this is not a surprise. Anyway, for the most part, tinnitus does ease and eventually fade over time, as mine did. I think my recent bout, like I mentioned, was triggered more by the COVID. Before we talk about what we can do about it, I do want to mention one caution, especially with pulsatile tinnitus. This type of tinnitus can be a sign of cardiovascular troubles, and thus it's always good, as it is with many of our concerns, to get it checked out by your doctor, as I did. Now, what can you do about tinnitus? Well, there are several doctors out there who work specifically with tinnitus and have some treatment options. According to the May Clinic, yes, <laughs> I'm just reading that verbatim. It meant to be Mayo Clinic, but in my notes, in my script, it says May Clinic, so I read it. <laughs> anyway, according to the Mayo Clinic, that's what I meant to say. Possible treatments of tinnitus include earwax removal. In fact, I, I, when I went to the ENT doc a couple months ago, I had no idea I had any earwax problems. And um, he actually found a ball of wax in my left ear that was, oh, what, half an inch diameter or more? I mean, I never couldn't believe it. He pulled it out, out of there. I never knew I had it. Um, now, it wasn't probably the call to tinnitus because my other ear's doing it, but it's another good reason to get these things checked out. Hearing aids can help if age is also a factor. And of course, changing a medication, which brings us back to benzos. Many people have used noise suppression to help with their tinnitus. That's also a very common technique. As our specific, uh, wow, I'm doing good. <laughs> I'm just leaving it in. As our specific counseling techniques, such as TRT, which is tinnitus retraining therapy, and of course, standard cognitive behavioral therapy or CBT. I'll put a link to this article in the show notes if you want to read more. But I know how tinnitus, how severely it can affect some people. And um, it has affected me off and on in my recovery, so I get it. And, and I wish you the best. I hope you, can, I hope you can find a solution. I hope we can find solutions for this soon. Our next item is a comment from Clint on our YouTube channel. Clint writes, I so wish I had the financial resources to go to the Colorado Rockies and stock up on excellent food and nutrients and calm and peace for my broken mental health and broken brain and spirit. Nature is my happy place, and I long for healing and true joy and complete peace of mind. I used to know this place so many years ago before I bought into the BS chemical imbalance theory of depression and anxiety disorders. I know the truth is out there and drugs do not cure. We need true love and compassion and real human connectivity and not fear and isolation. I do know that actual mental illness does exist, but I have come to realize that we need each other and not just drugs and symptom management. I am going to get my life back. Knowledge is powerful. Educate yourselves and fight the good fight and take back your mental and physical health. Clint. Oh, thank you, Clint. I'm going to just go back on a couple of things that you mentioned. I thought there was a lot to unpack here. Colorado Rockies, I live there. I love them. The nature is just everywhere out here on the middle and western part of the state. The eastern part is kind of flat, like Kansas, but the middle of the state with the mountains is gorgeous. I love the fact that nature is your happy place. It is mine too. Um, few things in life for me are as peaceful as a mountain stream sitting on a boulder under a shady tree and just relaxing. Boy, that, that's a great place to be. The BS chemical imbalance theory, uh, yeah, it seems to be that this theory that all depression and anxiety was based on 
a chemical imbalance has really not held water. And we've seen that repeatedly, especially considering the, what these medications have done and the side effects that they've had. But I love how you close this out, Clint. I'm going to get my life back. Knowledge is powerful. Educate yourselves and fight the good fight. Some great messages. It sounds like you got the perseverance to get through this. Um, anyway, I just wanted to share it here. I thought that was a great message. And thanks for sharing your comment. And that's going to wrap up. Um, thanks to Charles. Thanks to Clint. I appreciate that. That's going to wrap up our mailbag. I have to remember what section I am doing. And we are going to move on to our Benzo story. Our Benzo story is from Edda in New Zealand, who wrote to me about her mom. Now, I'm not sure if I'm pronouncing her name correctly, and if I'm not, my apologies. Now, I do want to put a note of caution here for everyone. This is a hard story to hear. It's a story full of suffering and an egregious lack of medical support, a story many of us are very far too familiar with. And thus, it might be triggering to some of our audience. If you have any concern that this story may be difficult for you to hear, please view our chapter list in our show notes. And feel free to skip ahead in this podcast. You can always do that on the show. Okay, now on to our Benzo story. Edda writes, Hey D, I found your channel on Spotify because I've been hoping to find some informative and honest information on benzo withdrawals. Long story short, I believe my mom, who is 65 years old with no history of mental illness or use of benzodiazepines and antidepressants, is suffering from severe withdrawal at the moment. She was put on temezepam by a GP at 5 to 10 milligrams as required to help her manage insomnia. Mom had never been on these meds before. Because mom was struggling to sleep, she decided to take higher doses of her medication, equaling 100 milligrams of temazepam within four days, which I would consider an accidental overdose. After this, mom was admitted to the hospital and did not continue her use of temazepam for the next six days. She was then diagnosed with major depression based on her presentation, which I believe was impacted by her accidental overdose. The psychiatrist at the hospital put mom back on 20 milligrams of temazepam, plus an antidepressant, vertazepine, at 15 milligrams for the first week, then taper up to 30 milligrams. While on the combined dose, mom started to experience paranoia, anxiety, delirium, and this was within a three-week window of starting the temazepam. With the advice from her GP, mom was taken off the mirtazapine and 20 milligrams of temazepam cold turkey, and things became much worse for her. She went into full-blown psychosis and went back to the hospital, who proceeded to sedate mom numerous times and use antipsychotics and various benzos to manage her illness. When we questioned what the medications had done to her and if she was going through withdrawal, all of the doctors told us that the meds had done nothing to mom, but it was unmasking her underlying depression. Before my mom started the temazepam drugs, the only issues she was having were sleep problems, headaches, and constipation. Mom has now lost about 18 kilograms in a three-month period from muscle wasting and lack of appetite. She barely eats or drinks. She's had horrible spasms of her muscles and tremors aggressions, depersonalization and derealization, constipation, urinary incontinence and retention, paranoia, insomnia, high levels of anxiety, depression, disassociation, and a whole lot more. No matter what her family have told numerous doctors, including mom's GP, who she has seen for the last three years, they all deny mom is going through withdrawal and continue to tell mom is severely depressed and anxious and needs to go on more drugs, including Effexor. We are now terrified of hospitals and doctors treating mom, given what's happened to her. She is no way near recovered at this point, and we are in a living nightmare seeing her suffer. There seems to be no professionals here in New Zealand that give a crap about our mom 
or understand how to manage her withdrawals. And we are left with the remnant of a mom who was once so independent and proud to a shell of who she was. I have started reading the Ashton Manual and have shared with my family for the sake of us arming ourselves with reputable information to fight a broken and horrible medical system who is more ready to drug than to help. Doctors are now what I call legal drug dealers. After seeing their lack of understanding, arrogance, and zero care factor in helping our family get mom through her pain. If you know anywhere here in New Zealand that could help us, or a contact in New Zealand we could rely on, I'd greatly appreciate your help. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Edda. Um, I have to admit right here that um, I had tears in my eyes when I first read this, when I first, um, when I added it to the script, and even now as I read it, this is a hard one to read. I am so, so, so sorry, Etta, for all that your mom, that you and your family have gone through. No one should have to go through this. No one. And yet I hear these stories each and every day. Please keep in mind, as I comment here, that I'm not a medical professional and nothing I say here on this podcast should ever be concerned medical advice. But I do want to talk about a few things that you mentioned. The ongoing doctor situation with benzodiazepines. I can't think of the words. It's difficult. It's frustrating. It's exacerbating. It almost makes you want to give up in what we do, but we don't. We keep going and we keep trying. We make progress, but the progress, considering the size of the problem, the progress seems like nothing, but we are making progress and we are trying to get the information out there. One of the things we've realized lately, especially with some of the work we do and with evaluating some of the legislation that has happened and with the education that we've been doing, is that there appears to be not just around benzodiazepines, but in general, a breakdown, and this is just my opinion, in the medical system of communication. There doesn't seem to be a really effective method for communi communicating updated information about treatments and medications to existing medical professionals. Now, I'm sure I'm overlooking something. I'm sure some of you out there are probably medical professionals and may say, oh, well, there's this or whatever. I know there are some ways, but we're seeing in some of the stuff we're working with that it's just not really happening. And most existing medical professionals get stuck. And part of it's probably arrogance, part of it's lack of education, part of it's lack of time. But they get stuck in their own mindset of what a medication is or what a treatment is or what the answer here is. And it's extremely frustrating for those of us who are trying to educate and to help them see that these drugs in many instances are causing more problems than they're curing. It's frustrating. It's frustrating. And I, I apologize for the system. I'm not, I'm not apologizing for me because I didn't do it, but I'm just sorry that it's happening. I'm glad that you started reading the Ashton Manual. I think arming yourself with good information is excellent. Please don't be afraid to check out my site more on information. I have tons on easing anxiety. Check out other reputable sites like um, Benzodiazepine Information Coalition and like the Alliance for Benzodiazepine Best Practices. Check these out. Get as much information as you can and um, and do what you can. But I, I wish... I wish I had more answers. I wish I knew of some good doctors in New Zealand. If anybody out there knows them, um, let me know and I can pass on the information. But, but this is not just a problem in the U.S. where I live. It's not just a problem in the U.K. It's a problem worldwide. worldwide. And we're all dealing with the same thing. And if we all work together, we can make some progress. Um, but this shouldn't be happening. I'm so sorry about your mom. I'm so sorry what you're going through. We're here. We'll do what we can to help. Um, please don't be afraid to keep reaching out and talking with us because we'll do whatever we can to help, but there's only so much we can do. So thank you. Thank you for the courage to share your story, your mom's story, and um, our prayers go out to you and your family. 
Uh, now let's um let's move on to our feature and let's see if we can um get back to a different um and I just want to comment one more thing on that is like I do share those stories. I know those can be triggering. That's why I put a warning up front or a caution up front. Um, and I don't do that for that reason. We've talked about this a thousand times, but please know, I think these stories are important to be told. I think these people's stories need to get out there. These stories have to get out there. Otherwise, things aren't going to change. I'm going to move on. You can tell it's kind of got me affected as it does every time I read ones like that. And I read so many like that. Let's move on to our future. Okay, so today our feature is about the loss of self during bind. On day two of my road trip to Atlanta for the RX Summit, I spoke some about the loss of confidence during benzo withdrawal. And I, I felt that topic deserved a lot more attention. So today I'm going to focus on that. So many of us struggle with low self-esteem, loss of freedom, loss of confidence, loss of who we are during bind. Many of us face personality changes during this time. Our, our relationships suffer, our careers suffer, our lives suffer. Parts of this experience can be very difficult to define. It's not easily identified in medical textbooks and, and rarely mentioned. One of the most significant effects of this experience, of this whole benzodiazepine journey we are on, is our loss of self, our loss of self-esteem, our loss of confidence, a loss of who we are, just being lost in life. And we're going to take a look at that today, what it is, what it entails, and perhaps even how we can best manage it. Protracted benzodiazepine withdrawal, or what I like to call BIND, which is benzodiazepine-induced neurological dysfunction. As I mentioned just briefly, for those who are new to the podcast, I just want to make sure I periodically catch you up on the terminology. <laughs> if you don't know about BIND and want to know about it, please visit my website, easinganxiety.com slash B-I-N-D, BIND. And um, I have a whole page there on the basics of BIND. You can learn about it, what it is. It's basically protracted benzodiazepine withdrawal with a few variances, but this is a new term. It's coming out. We're trying to use it everywhere, and it's starting to take hold. So um, this is not, you know, I'm not going to go to details. That's, that's a different time, but <laughs> go learn more if you want to. Anyway, this experience of benzo withdrawal is intense. It can be overwhelming and also life-altering. For many of us, it is the most difficult experience of our lives, and one that can linger for months, even years. And for that reason, we change during it. Our bodies change. Our minds change. Our personalities change. Many of us find ourselves trying to discover who we are again, and have a sense of feeling lost and dealing with a constant sense of loss, including what we hold most dear in this life, which is our sense of self. Let me start with a few numbers here. I, I've been involved in various research teams on benzodiazepines. I've shared that with you on the podcast, including the Bind and Nosology team, the Benzo Survey team, and other teams through ASAM and um, CDC, whatever. <laughs> I've been on a few different teams. It's hard to keep track. The Benzo Survey team, um, sponsored by the Alliance for Benzodiazepine Best Practices, we did the research and published two papers. We got a third one coming out here soon. And some of the findings from that survey are relevant here. So I wanted to share that with you to kind of kick us off with a few stats. In case you don't remember, that survey was of 1,207 benzo affected individuals, and it was done in 2018 2019. And this was originated by Dr. Jane McCubrey and Dr. Christy Huff. I'm on the research team and an author on the papers that have been published and we're continuing to do more work. But our third paper and our final paper on the survey hopefully will be coming out here in the next month. When the survey respondents were asked if their discontinuation symptoms had affected specific areas of their lives, here are the numbers. As for fun, recreation, and hobbies, 89% said yes, benzos had affected that part of their lives. For social interaction and friendships, 86%. Ability to take care of home and others, 
Relationships with spouse and family, also 85%. Work life, 83%. Ability to drive or walk, 76%. Of all the ones asked here, over three quarters of the people who filled out the survey said these areas of their lives were affected by benzodiazepines. When you look at these numbers, how could anyone say that this experience did not significantly affect who we are? This experience can affect almost every aspect of our lives. So yes, of course it is going to change how we view our relationships, our careers, our families, and most of all, ourselves. One of the key struggles I have seen in the individuals I have worked with is the loss of confidence, that loss of self-esteem. And I must admit, I too have suffered from this since my withdrawal. Even more so in the last few years, like the last few months, actually. I believe this loss of confidence is often caused by many factors. One being our limitations. As much of the research has shown, many of us can't work, can't maintain our relationships, can't travel, can't even leave our home or even beds some days. Some of us can't be exposed to any type of stressful situation even if it is on the TV or radio or the internet. Some of us can't provide for our families or care for loved ones or raise our own children or travel on business trips or take vacations or socialize or build new relationships. So many changes, so many limitations, so many alterations. For the most part, I've been pretty comfortable in most social situations throughout my life. I've never had any public speaking anxiety or social anxieties to speak of. I could speak in front of a thousand people and have. But now, eight and a half years off Clonopin, I've lost some of that confidence. I'm a bit more nervous speaking in front of people or in a virtual meeting. Not significantly, but it's there. Last year, we had to record a video for a continuing, med uh, yeah, continuing medical education course that we had done through the work group. And I'm on camera trying to read a laptop next to me and speak for this video that they're gonna produce that's gonna go out to all these doctors and everything. And I come into those with confidence, but here I am talking and I'm stuttering and my legs shaking and I'm a little nervous and I, I can't figure out what's going on. This was not me, but it is now, at least for a little while. I'm a bit more nervous now when I speak in front of people or in a virtual meeting. Not significantly, but it's there. I still do it because I don't want to lose that skill. And I will fight to keep it. But I am different. Where I notice the most significant difference lately is in meetings. I don't speak up as much as I used to, especially in all these virtual meetings that we have now. I was always better in the room and in person. I loved being with people and seeing people face to face and seeing their mannerisms. And I have to admit the virtual meetings are a little more difficult to me, but even those, I was better at that when we started those during COVID and such. And now I'm not as comfortable. I don't know. Maybe it's a good thing. I used to be pretty vocal in meetings. Um, I would dominate sometimes and frequently organized and led projects. So maybe too much, but now that part of me isn't as comfortable. I, I question, and this is part of it, I question if my input is really of value. And I do that a lot. And so I sometimes step back, or I quite often now step back and let others take the lead. I mean, I'm in multiple benzo meetings every week now. Benzodiazepine mean research meetings, community work group meetings, educational development meetings, and quite often with doctors, psychiatrists, PhDs, all these people at the top of their fields. And then there's me. <laughs> little old D.E. Foster with nothing more than a B.A. in communication who's wondering what the hell he's doing in these meetings sometimes. Now, I know that I work my butt off to get where I am now, and I know that I do bring knowledge and experience to the table, but still, we all question our value at times, don't we? And I've been doing that more lately, a lot more lately, than I ever used to. And I'm sharing that with you because this is what I think many other people are dealing with. And 
maybe it's a little embarrassing, but I don't care because I've shared with you more embarrassing things before. So this is not new. Now, I'm all for humility. In fact, I think it's an extremely valuable virtue. And I strive for being humble whenever I can, often failing, but still trying. I really do. I truly value one of my favorite quotes is always be humble and kind from an old country song. And um, I just think those are two excellent values. And the last thing I ever want to be seen is egotistical. I just don't value that. And I hope I never come across that way. It's not who I am. But confidence is different than egoism. It's not about thinking you are better than anybody else. It's about knowing you bring value and that your voice matters, not more than others, but as much as others. And that's an important trait to have. And I've struggled with that lately. Confidence is a fragile thing. We can try and fake it, but if we don't believe it deep inside, it's just not real. And we feel fake. And honestly, others can sense it too. Our symptoms and limitations eat away at that sense of confidence, that sense of self over time. Cognitive dysfunction, memory loss, those are big factors. It's hard to feel of value at work, at home, with friends, when your memory constantly fails you. Or you're so easily overwhelmed that you snap at those you love. Or you can't remember the details of that assignment your boss just gave you. Or the pressures, the deadlines, the expectations just make you freeze. You hit that benzo wall and can't think, can't remember, can't perform, can't work. Now mix in depersonalization and derealization and you don't even know what to believe, let alone what to remember. Anxiety is a big part of this too and it often exacerbates that brain fog. Insomnia doesn't help for sure. Few things affect our daily performance like lack of sleep, and few things affect our sleep like benzo withdrawal. As for exercise, we try to exercise, but muscle strains, pain, aches, pulls, and tears can often keep us sidelined for much of the game. And what about benzo belly, urinary difficulties, a pelvic floor dysfunction? If your diet is limited to two or three foods, or your stomach looks like you are seven months pregnant, or you can't be more than 10 feet from a bathroom, and you don't think you can make it through a 30-minute meeting, life becomes limited and embarrassing. If you have trouble breathing, swallowing, speaking, or being in bright or noisy rooms, your life becomes limited. If you can't sit still without the urge to get up and move, or your arm won't stop twitching in the middle of that big meeting, or you are angry all the time and people start avoiding you at work and at home. Your life is limited. I can go on and on and on, but I think we get the idea. Bind is limiting and our sense of self and our sense of confidence take a big hit from that. So with all that being said, what can we do about this? What can we do about our loss of self, our loss of confidence, our loss of self-esteem? Well, this is where I have the good news. Here are some options that have been proven to be helpful. One of the things that many of us have extra of during BIND is time. Now, I realize that some of us, especially in more severe acute withdrawal, find it very difficult to read or even watch a video and understand or even retain its message. I realize that and completely understand that there may be times when you could do nothing more than just lay around and heal. But that is not all the time, not even most of the time for the majority of us. And since this condition can often affect our relationships, work, and social interactions, we are often left with a lot of free time. Time we far too often use to contemplate our fate ruminate on our state and worry about what's on our plate. <laughs> Sorry, I got caught up in trying to rhyme things there. Uh, <laughs> all that time can be put to good use. Learn about benzos and bind, get counseling, read about psychology, mindfulness, spirituality, or anything that might benefit you 
or watch videos and listen to podcasts on similar topics. Surround yourself with positive influences. We are what we consume. So consume good stuff, beneficial stuff, helpful stuff. Laugh or learn to laugh even when you are mired in hardship, especially when you are mired in hardship because that's when you need it the most. And last but not least, spend time with the ones you love. Even if you aren't able to do much, just be there. Be with them. Show them that you care. And while you're at it, tell them thank you, that you need them each and every day. You have time. Make use of it. One of the hardest aspects of buying is learning to accept it. This is all about change. Our lives have been changed for good or for bad. Well, mostly for bad, definitely in the beginning. But they have been changed nonetheless. But still, for the most part, in bind, we change. And as human beings, we don't like change, especially challenging changes, limiting changes, painful changes. We'd rather that things stay the same than face challenges like that. We've talked about acceptance many times in this podcast, and this is where acceptance is most useful. If you are experiencing benzo withdrawal or bind, your life has changed. You can fight against that fact all you like, but you are not going to change it. It's a fact. It's a very painful and sorrowful fact to accept, but a fact nonetheless. Eventually, most of us come to a point of acceptance. This happened. There is nothing I can do to stop it, so I might as well make the best of it that I can. This is a good time for us to develop new tools, get some counseling, exercise more, eat a better diet. And you have the motivation to do those things because the penalties can be severe. Think of Bind as a life coach, a very strict, severe life coach. If you veer even the slightest bit from the plan, the recovery plan, the healing plan, whatever you want to call it, the consequences are severe, often resulting in pain or injury. But work with the coach, and even though he's a total jerk, <laughs> of course, but work with him, and you might find some of what he is teaching you, anxiety tools, breathing techniques, exercise, CBT, yoga, mindfulness, diet, whatever, not only will help you through your withdrawal, but will make you a better person in the long run. It's a shaky metaphor, I'll admit, but maybe it works to some degree. What, what I'm trying to say is that change is inevitable. So is saying that word. Back up. What I'm trying to say is that change is inevitable in benzo withdrawal. So if we're going to change, why not make it a positive change? Here are some tips to close this out. I did some research for today's feature, as I often do when I script my podcast, and I came across some tips for helping to improve general self-esteem. So here are six of these that I think might be relevant to us. I'll put a link to these articles in the show notes in case you want to learn more. Number one, challenge bad thoughts about yourself. We ruminate until the cows come home in bind, and it is not helpful. Whenever you have negative talk about yourself, challenge it. Sometimes you can write down things that you do well to counter your negative thoughts. There's a lot of techniques. But don't allow those negative thoughts to ruminate without any kind of pushback. Number two, set goals. Set goals for you to accomplish. These don't have to be, be bleh, have to be. <laughs> you know, big goals for me is learning how to talk <laughs> better. <laughs> These don't have to be big goals. In fact, it's often better to set little goals. And when you succeed, when you reach that little goal, which may be doing the laundry today, celebrate, be proud, know you did this, and then build on it with the next challenge. If you don't set goals, you'll never get that satisfaction that we need to help lift our self-esteem. Number three, surround yourself with people who support you. Surround yourself with people who make you feel good, who help you feel better about yourself. If you ever want to know whether or not somebody's beneficial to you, just think, when you spend time with them, afterwards, how do you feel? That often is a pretty good marker. You have enough negative self-talk. 
You don't need to hear it from others. Number four, exercise. I mention this all the time. Few things in life can bring you more healthy benefits than exercise. Do what you can. Don't push yourself and injure yourself. That's a risk during buying. But instead, listen to your body and do what you can. There are so many benefits here. I don't even know where to start, so I'm going to move on. Number five, improve your posture. According to Amy Cuddy in an article in Positive Psychology, she said, posture sends messages to the brain that can actually change the way you feel. So if you want to feel more powerful, sit up straight, smile, or stand in a powerful pose, and that message will be sent to your brain. That makes sense. And let's face it, every little bit helps. And six, one of my all-time favorites, mindfulness. Mindfulness is a practice that has helped many through benzo withdrawal, and it helps with self-esteem too. Become aware of your body, your breathing, your sensations. Feel the energy around you. Feel your presence. Be in the moment and let go of the worry about the past and about the future. Just be in the now. You are here. You are valued. And this moment is all there is right now. Oh, well, I hope this was helpful to those of you struggling with issues. The loss of confidence, loss of purpose, loss of self, loss of self-esteem. It is very common in benzo withdrawal and bind. But it's only temporary. On the other side is a new self, maybe even a better self, most likely a better self. But that's up to you. Now, if you allow me just 25 seconds, I'm about to say 15, 25 seconds, I have to remember these things. We're going to get to our moment of peace. We, did, we do have the moment of peace coming up, but if you allow me 25 seconds for our disclaimer, we will get right to it. So hang on. This podcast is for informational purposes only and should not be considered medical advice in any way. The host of this podcast is not a medical professional, nor is he engaged in rendering medical health or psychological advice nor any other kind of personal professional services. The views and opinions expressed by our listeners and interview guests on this podcast, whether read from textual submissions or presented in their own voice, do not necessarily reflect those of the Benzofree podcast or of its host. Withdrawal tapering or any other change in dosage of benzodiazepines, non-benzodiazepines, or any other prescription drugs should only be done under the direct supervision of a licensed physician. Our full disclaimer can be viewed on our website at benzofree.org slash disclaimer. And that brings us to our closing, our moment of peace. It's just one minute, and it's an opportunity to quiet the mind a bit before you return to the chaos of the real world. Please remember that you should only do this if you are in a safe place where you can close your eyes, relax, and let the world pass by without you for a minute. Today's meditation is a listening meditation. As I'm speaking to you now, we are experiencing a multi-day rainstorm here in Colorado. This is unusual for us, and I, for one, embrace it. While rain and cloudy days can be depressing to some, it is also one of the most commonly requested sounds for meditation. I love the rain. Peaceful, soothing, relaxing. There's nothing you can do to stop the rain except just let it happen and enjoy the sound as it cleanses the air and earth around us. Today all I ask is that you listen to the sound of the storm as it passes. Nothing else. Just listen. You are safe and dry, sitting by a fire, staring out the window, watching the storm pass. And if your mind wanders a bit, no worries. Just gently bring it back to the sounds that surround you. Let's get started. Close your eyes and relax. Take a deep breath in. Hold it for a second and let it out slowly. Let's do that again. 
Take a deep breath in. Hold it for a second. And let it out slowly along with all the stress of the day. One more time. Take a deep breath in. Hold it for a second. And let it out slowly, relaxing your entire body. Now just be slowly and natural. And listen to the sounds of the storm. No fear, no worries, no thoughts. Just the sound. Continue to do this for one minute. Our next scheduled episode is episode 123, and it will be released next month. Thank you again for joining me today, and please, let us know how we did. Keep calm, taper slowly, and take care of yourself. I'll see you next time.